Hey, welcome to episode 11 of Fridays with Farhan. Um, once again this week, I'm sorry I could not uh, make this on Friday, but uh, from next time I will try to be on time. Today's Fridays with Farhan has tons of great questions. We have topics including uh, circumcision, watery sperm, how to sleep better. Um, there's stuff about whether someone should get a PhD, what to do to find your passion. There's also a question, question about turmeric capsules. That's gonna blow your mind. There's actually some fantastic research that's gonna be a really shocker uh, for you when it comes to turmeric supplementation. There's also some stuff about uh, testosterone boosters in terms of herbs and, and, and natural supplementation for that. And uh, yeah, how to, how to improve memory, uh, yeah, that's basically what uh, we have today. Let me make sure I got everything. Uh, oh yeah, there's there's something about veganism uh, and exactly what I eat. So I'm basically gonna list every single food I eat as a vegan, and uh, these are all plant-based whole foods. And uh, yeah, that's uh, what we have. So let's get started. If you go in the description below, you will see timestamps of all the different topics. So if you don't want to listen to the whole video, you don't want to listen to every answer, then go in the timestamps and look at the keywords, look at what the questions and answers are and what topics are discussed, and just go to that time in the video so you can get the value uh, just for that inquiry that you have, okay? And also, Happy New Year to you. Um, may you have the best 2018, the best year ever, uh, full of happiness and health, and uh, yeah, wish you the best and uh, good luck with everything, with all your goals. So the first question we have is, hello Farhan, uh, I am sleeping almost 50% more hours than I was before starting the Doc T program. I often exercise after work. I come home and sometimes have difficulty calming down after work and or exercise. I wonder what activities or supplements might help transition into sleep mode. Obviously, I don't watch TV or get too involved with my phone. I do take the ZMA supplement and often honey and vinegar as you recommended. Any further revelations? So first of all, bravo, man. It seems like you're already sleeping quite well and much better than you used to, and you're taking the supplements and, and, and taking the recommendations into account, and that's actually helping your body and your mind. So great, that's awesome. Um, before I answer your question, the Doc T program that, that uh, our boy is referring to is uh, the RIM program, R-Y-M, Reclaim Your Masculinity. Um, if you are wondering about the videos and the, the courses and, and eBooks and audiobooks that we have, just go in the description below. There's links there for free stuff. Uh, for example, the blueprint, which is the testosterone blueprint, the seven hacks to boost your testosterone naturally today. Uh, go get that, and then you're going to get emails uh, to understand how to obtain RIM and other video courses that we have available, for example, the Masterclass. And all of these are very comprehensive. They cover uh, what I have learned in the last four years, what I have learned by coaching clients one-on-one, -on -one, uh, what our clients, the feedback they've given us, and how we've improved all, all those programs and all those courses. So all of that will be given to you in the emails. And just keep in mind, uh, this is a very comprehensive program to boost testosterone naturally. We give you the meal prep, exactly how to prepare your food, um, how to cook your food, exactly how to do the exercises to boost your testosterone naturally. And just uh, something about me, I recently got my blood checked and not only my total testosterone, but my bioavailable and my free testosterone have doubled, all of them. And I will be showing you all of those results in an upcoming video and I will be making all of my blood results public for you to download and look at and, and compare with uh, what I was, you know, three years ago until now. So really, really good results, you know, with cholesterol, vitamin B12, vitamin D, magnesium, zinc, uh, glucose levels, cholesterol levels, you know, all the, the, all the different types of cholesterols, HDL, LDL, and so on, all the ratios, everything I'm going to cover in a future video. So to answer your question about sleep, so a couple of things that I've learned very recently that have helped me relax. I don't really have a problem with sleeping at night, but I'll tell you these two things that I haven't covered yet. The first one is using either a foam roller or a double lacrosse ball to go across your, along your spine in the back, vertebra by vertebra. Now, what, what is it? So a foam roller, I'm sure you know what that is. If you don't know, just go look it up on Google. Not just you, but anyone who's listening. 
uh, but something better, it's known as a double lacrosse ball. It's basically two lacrosse balls that are taped together. You can buy something like that. It's also known as a peanut, or you can just take two lacrosse balls and put a sock around it. And what you do is you line that across your spine and you just go down along your spine, vertebra by vertebra, all the way from the top, you know, near your brain stem, all the way down to your coccyx bone. And I do that before my workouts and sometimes even after or sometimes just at home. And that helps me a lot in terms of becoming relaxed, really, really uh, like getting in tune with my body. I just feel very, very just chill and and, and just like in Zen mode after I do that. So that is one thing that I would recommend. The second thing, um, it, it's something not totally new, but it's something that's very important and I wanna cover, and that is don't do anything in your bedroom except for sleeping. You want your brain and your body to get ready for sleeping when you see that bed, right? When you open your door and you see your bedroom, there should not be all this clutter in there, dirty, you know, stuff or, or anything that is contaminating the coziness of that bedroom. So for example, if you have books in there or movies or television or anything that is not to do with sleeping, right? So, so obviously you can, you can make love in your bedroom, you know, have sex in your bedroom, but you can just those two activities, that and sleep. You know, I wouldn't even read in there or meditate in there, none, none of that. Like all of your spaces in your apartment or in your house have to be made for a specific purpose. Don't contaminate it with other purposes, okay? So your bedroom is for sleeping and having sex only. If you wanna meditate, you wanna read, you wanna watch movies, you wanna, you want to uh, you know, work out, even the relaxation technique I told you about with the foam roller, don't do it in your bedroom, do it somewhere else. When you enter your bedroom, it is to sleep and calm your ass down. That's what I have. Um, I made a video recently where I give you seven tips on how to sleep better. I hope you've looked at that. If not, it's in one of the previous uh, Fridays with Farhan's. Okay, so that's that. Next question, Nathan. Hi Farhan, really enjoyed your video on tips for getting better sleep. Okay, that's, that, that was his question before. The number one reason why I'm having trouble sleeping is because I have to get up to pee one to three times per night even though all I drink is water and tea during the day. While I am able to quickly get back to sleep, I do consider this an interruption and would like to know if you have any tips on this issue. Yes, it is an interruption and one of the tips that I've given many times in the past and I'll give it again here, you have to not interpret your sleep while you are in bed at night. So if you're sleeping eight, now, eight hours a night, nine hours a night, you have to do it continuously. Don't get up during the night because that disturbs your sleep cycles. And as you go along the night, your REM cycle becomes longer and longer. and It is the longest at the end of the night. And REM is the time when testosterone is synthesized in your testes by the Leydig cells. So you want that REM cycle to be at its longest. And if you wake up, the REM cycle again starts with the shortest. So you don't want to do that. If that's confusing, comment below and I'll make another video about it. But essentially, just, just to recap, to make it clear, when you go to sleep, there's different cycles of sleep, right? Stage one, stage two, stage three. REM is known as stage six. It's the rapid eye movement. So during that stage, that is when you have, you know, your eyes are moving rapidly. That is also some of the, uh, one of the phases when you dream or the, the dominant phase when you dream at night. And that is also when testosterone is produced and memory is consolidated. There's a lot of research done on REM sleep. Now, if you interrupt, let's say you don't interrupt, right? You sleep eight hours a night or nine hours a night. Your REM cycle is going to get longer and longer and longer. So that last REM cycle might be like two hours. So you're getting testosterone synthesis for those two hours. But if you disrupt your sleep, you interrupt your sleep, you wake up at night, then that long cycle as it was getting longer and longer. Let's say you're on the let's say you're on the third REM cycle of the night. You know, it's like 4 a.m., 3 a.m. and you wake up. You disrupt your sleep cycle. Then that REM sleep instead of it being, you know, an hour and a half or an hour, it again starts off with, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes depending on your physiology, how long it is in you. Okay? So, I would highly recommend that you pee out all your water 
two to three hours before you go to sleep. It's that simple. It's not brain surgery. <laughs> so let's say you go to sleep at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. You have your meal three hours before, you know, 8 p.m., 7 p.m. You know, you're doing intermittent fasting, so you, 11 a.m. is your first meal. Let's say 7 p.m. is your last meal. And you drink your water during the day. But after 7 p.m., don't consume any meals or water. Then at 10 when you go to sleep, there is nothing in your body to produce urine. Right? There's a, the water, you've already urinated it. And, and just that little uh, water that you need to urinate at night, it's going to be so little that it won't wake you up to actually go to the bathroom. Now, try that first. There are cases uh, like urinary tract infections, you know, it's, it's uh, UTIs. And there are other cases that are more disorders of urination where you have to wake up at night. That usually happens when you're older, you know, 60, 70, when you can't control urine and your bladder is weak and so on. I hope that's not the case in you yet because you're very young. But if you do this when you, you know, eat or drink at 7 p.m. and then you stop, and this continues to happen, then send me another question in a couple of weeks and I will give you the research on all of that disease stuff, all the, the, the bladder diseases that are out there because we want to make sure this, uh, you're, you're fixing this ASAP. Okay, let's go on to the next question. Question three. Miha, I would love you to help me with something. I think I have low T and problems with getting dick hard with girls. I had sex with my ex-girlfriend but had... S- Still problems with getting dick hard sometimes. I don't know what to do or what is a problem. I work out regularly, lift weights for years, sleep seven to eight hours daily or more. I just recently started to eat flux and chia seeds. F- flax, I mean, he, he thinks he, he means flax. And pumpkin seeds. I normally don't get morning wood. I have low sex drive. I am not fat, but muscular. 6'1 and 81 kilograms and 23 years old. I don't think I have low energy level. I am motivated and have ambitions. So I would love your help about that and sorry for my English bro. All right. So lifting heavy, eating well, sleeping well, removing toxins from your environment, um, listening to your body in terms of macros and what you need to eat, whether you need to be on a plant-based diet or a meat-based diet or whatever. That's sure. That's fundamental. and, And this is the traditional view. However, There are also aspects of getting your dick hard or getting an erection in terms of blood flow, right? So if you are eating healthy, if you are exercising well, there's going to be blood flow in your, the blood vessels of your penis. However, there are certain natural supplements that you can take to increase that blood flow into your penis. So the one natural supplement for which there has been the most experiments as well as the most proof in terms of libido, right? So sex drive, which you don't have a problem with, as well as erection quality. So stiffness, hardness, uh, how long the erection is going to last because of the increase in blood flow or whatever the mechanism is. It's very hard to determine the mechanism. They're still looking for the mechanism. That supplement is known as Tonkatali. Okay, now I have tried it in the past. I've tried it from several companies but I will start trying Tonkatali very soon again, probably in the next week or two. So I will update you on what my experiments are with Tonkatali. What I have read in the research is that Tonkatali is the one supplement which actually works to boost testosterone. There's evidence that it actually boosts testosterone, that's one, and it helps with erections, so it increases the quality of your erections, of your boners. And three, it helps with sex drive and general energy levels during the day. There's scientific proof for all of these over and over and over in multiple, multiple studies. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in the description, include all of the studies that I read to discover this information. So you can read those studies and uh, your proof is right there. And once I start trying this, make sure you're following me on my Instagram stories uh, because I talk about everything I eat, my exercise routines, all the stuff that is going on during the day with me, as well as uh, 
uh, the supplements that I'm going to try. I'm going to show you exactly what doses I'm trying, how it's affecting me. So follow me at Doc Testosterone on Instagram and uh, good luck with that too. Next. Mike Z. Hi, Farhan. I have your Reclaim Your Masculinity video program, which goes into the diet supplements exercises. I realized that you've gone vegan. I was strongly considering starting to eat meat, eggs, uh, etc. But now that you've gone vegan, I think I'd rather stick to being vegan. LOL. I was on the fruit, fruit uh, oh, fruititarian diet and my testosterone was very low. But now I feel like it's getting better and more healthy fats in my diet. I'm very curious in the vegan meal plan, what foods to eat and when. I suppose I could just substitute meat and eggs for avocados, olive oil, coconut oil, and nuts for the time being, but, but would love to hear your advice on vegan meal plans. So in RIM, Reclaim Your Masculinity, in, when you go into the program, you, you have your, your videos are there, the eBooks, the audiobooks. One of the eBooks is the plant-based meal plan where you have exactly what you should be eating at what times during the day if you are following a strict plant-based uh diet whole foods diet so that's there maybe maybe uh you missed it uh surprised that you missed it it's it's right there for you now what i'm gonna do right now is list exactly what i eat um on a vegan meal plan okay now what you mentioned uh olive oil coconut oil um I don't really use olive oil that much anymore, although I used to put it on my salads. Um, I'm not a big fan of olive oil anymore. I just don't use it. Coconut oil I use for cooking my beans and lentils. So I, for my beans and lentils, I use the rice cooker to cook it twice. And then I put it in the, in the, in the actual uh, stove and I use coconut oil and I mix it with coconut oil to actually cook it. And that helps you know f- me fart less and whatnot. Uh, nuts, of course. Uh, you know, pecans, pistachios, almonds, Brazil nuts, um, uh, walnuts, uh, and, and cashews. These are my favorites. Uh, yeah, so let's, let me list, and then avocados, of course, uh, once every day and sometimes once per meal, okay? So I do two meals a day usually. Uh, and again, you want to get details of all this, just follow me on Instagram at Testosterone. Uh, let me show you exactly what I eat. I'm just going to fucking list it. So beans, mung black, red, kidney, whole grain bread, all types of nut butters, chickpeas, split peas, other peas, lentils, yellow or red, brown rice, sweet potatoes, white rice, quinoa, kale, broccoli, hemp hearts, avocados, as I mentioned, all types of nuts, as I mentioned. New nuts that I've been trying are are tiger nut powder, uh, and of course macadamia, I forgot to mention that. Tons of greens, so arugula, spinach, red peppers, uh, lemon, lime, Fruits like crazy, you know, diversity of fruits, like lots of berries, like blueberries, acai, goji berries, dragon berries, apricots, figs, pomegranate powder and pomegranates, uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, probiotics or kombucha, sauerkraut, beets, kimchi, carrots, dandelion greens, coconut milk, kefir, vitamin D, B12. These are the supplements that I take and enzymes. It's a lot, eh? Uh, that's what I eat on my vegan diet. Uh, now again, remember, in RIM, there is a meat-based plan and a vegan plan. They're both there. And look, don't just become a plant-based eater or a meat-based eater because I tell you to. You have to listen to your body. Now, January 1st, I will have finished six full months of being a vegan. Now, in the new year, if I try eating meat again or i try eating dairy or eggs to see how my body feels that's fine like you have to try that too don't don't restrict yourself to one diet like i am a vegan i am a meat eater i am a fruitarian don't think like that you are what makes your body happy that's what you want to eat you don't want to eat based on some some weird thing that some doctor or scientist said or wrote a book about that's not the issue don't follow me like, like, like I'm God or some guru. I'm not. I'm just a little bit less confused about nutrition as you are. Maybe even more because I read so much more. So there's doctors who eat only meat. There's doctors who are vegan. There's doctors who promote keto or paleo or whatever, right? Some doctors say eggs are great. Some doctors say eggs are bad. So you have to listen to your body. You have to do your own research. I'm only here as a tool right? So don't just 
become vegan because I'm vegan. That's not smart, okay? I became vegan because I listened to my body and I wanted to experiment to see how it is. My testosterone doubled, right? I mean, not just because of a vegan diet, obviously, a lot of other life changes too, but the vegan diet was a big part of my life in the last six months and my testosterone went up by 200 points, my total testosterone. So maybe there's a thing there. Now, if I introduce meat into my diet again or eggs or dairy in the upcoming year, then I'm experimenting, I'm learning, right? This is how we gradually learn and become better and better as we go forward. So, okay. <laughs> what are the true mechanisms of Mukuna Purian's work on the PTA system of men? Now, I don't know what you mean by the PTA system. Uh, there's no such thing. Maybe I'm missing something here, but uh, I'm assuming you mean on the sex system or the erection system or some kind of system which involves uh, sexual activity, sexual health. So I'm going to address it from that perspective because all the research on Mukuna Purians has been done for erectile dysfunction, libido, and nitric oxide and stuff like that. So essentially, Mukuna Purians has this active compound called L-DOPA. L-DOPA is the precursor to dopamine. Okay, now we know that dopamine is the prominent uh, neurotransmitter that is used for sex erections, whereas testosterone is also involved a little bit, but dopamine is the prominent one. Testosterone is more involved in morning wood, in libido, and other aspects of muscle growth, but dopamine is more involved in reward function. The striatum is a part of the brain uh, where this entire dopamine reward circuit takes place. I've talked about this in other videos, so go consult those, but just to answer your question, the way it works is there are different active compounds in Mukuna purians. The L-DOPA system is there to trigger dopamine release and to increase dopamine in your brain, which obviously is gonna help with erections. Now, one thing you probably don't know, because I'm assuming, because you're asking me about Mukuna purians, you have already done your research and you know about the whole L-DOPA story. Now, what you probably don't know is that there are other active compounds in Mukuna purians that help with nitric oxide production. Now, why is that important? So the way erections work is there is nitric oxide production, which helps the erection happen and be maintained. And so what is the whole pathway? So there are two types of enzymes that produce nitric oxide. There is NNOS and ENOS. Okay, so the way you remember NNOS is N is for neuron or neural brain related. E is for endothelium or endothelial cell related. So these two enzymes produce nitric oxide and release it into the penile arterioles and cavernous sinusoids. These are the blood vessels in the penis, which because of the nitric oxide release and the nitric oxide flowing and the fact that nitric oxide stays there, it allows for this erection to happen. Now, it's not just nitric oxide. Nitric oxide triggers through other compounds the release of cyclic GMP, okay? Now, as cyclic GMP increases, we have a relaxation in smooth muscle, which causes the blood flow to happen and be maintained. Now, cyclic GMP is degraded or broken down by something known as phosphodiesterase, okay? We talked about this in, a previous, in the previous episode 10 where I talked about Viagra. What Viagra does is it inhibits phosphodiesterase, specifically phosphodiesterase 5, PDE5. Why? Because PDE5 is breaking down cyclic GMP. And when cyclic GMP breaks down, the erections go away, right? You go from tumescens, which is erection, to detumescens, which is having a flaccid penis. So what Viagra is doing is it is inhibiting that PDE5 so your cyclic GMP can stay in your blood vessel so you can maintain the erection. Now what Mukuna Purians is doing, active compounds inside, is they're actually increasing the production of ENOS, the endothelial NOS, NOS, which is nitric oxide synthase, which is an enzyme that produces nitric oxide. So by increasing the production of nitric oxide through ENOS, Mukuna Purians is able to help with your erection. I hope that makes sense. If not, 
Comment below and I'll try to be even clearer next time. Let's go on to the next question. Thoughts on circumcisions. Serious question. Do you think it's an ideal way to go for every baby? Is it natural? How do you see it? Great question. So there's a lot of research on circumcisions. Okay, I'm going to get into a little bit of it here and comment below and I can answer specific questions because this is a loaded topic. It can go on for hours. <coughs> so uh, circumcisions obviously also have a political, religious, cultural aspect to it, right? Like as a Muslim, I was circumcised, but it's not, wasn't so much a, any reason except, oh, Muslims are circumcised. That's it. Now, what is circumcision for, for a lot of you might not know. So circumcision is when you remove the prepuce, which is this uh, layer of skin, you basically remove it from the penis. It is right on top of the glands, which is the top of the penis, like the, the top of the shaft of the penis. Okay, you remove that. And the reason that has always been claimed medically is because underneath that prepuce, it is easier to have an infection because there's germs that can grow underneath, there's, there's other issues and so on. Now, what Africa started doing, especially places like Uganda, even South Africa, Rwanda, uh, Zimbabwe, they started looking at how circumcision might reduce the rate of AIDS. Right? Because obviously we know AIDS is very prevalent in Africa and it's, it's a big problem. So what they wanted to do was they wanted to look at the correlation between those who are circumcised and those who have AIDS. And they found very significant correlations. So people who are circumcised tend to have AIDS less of the time. Now, that might not apply to you or me. Okay? Because now again, we're talking about heterosexual sex here. You know, getting AIDS through heterosexual sex, uh, homosexual that 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 wasn't studied, and and that and no one hypothesizes that it's relevant for homosexual sex. It's specifically for heterosexual sex. Okay, now a lot of the world people don't get circumcised. So if you look at the map of the world, like South America, people don't really get circumcised. Less than twenty percent of the people in South America get circumcised, or Russia. Or, or other parts of the world. India is not, not very much. But then you look at other parts of the world, like Pakistan, uh, like the United States, um, certain parts of, of Africa and Europe, it's greater than 80% of the people who get circumcised. So it just depends on the part of the world you're from, what religion you belong to, and so on. So the main medical issue or the medical claim is one, that it removes the the, the probability of having an infection is a little bit less because germs grow underneath the penis. But obviously, if you wash uh, that, you know, that prepuce uh, part that was cut off during circumcision, if you still have that and you, and you, you know, foreskin, as you can call it, if you wash that well, then the rate of infection or the probability of infection is going to be way less. So it's a, it's a little bit of an argument, but it's not really convincing me. Now, the other parts, for example, hey, uh, does sexual sensitivity decrease if you remove the foreskin? No, it does not. The research shows that in terms of sexual satisfaction, sexual fulfillment, uh, the ability to perform, stamina, all those stay the same even you know between people who have foreskin and people who don't have foreskin. It, it doesn't really matter that way. And... And in terms of AIDS, uh, just wear a condom, right? So th that's basically the argument against circumcision. If you're, if you're someone who's afraid that you're going to get AIDS, you just wear a condom, and that's going to make your percentage about one percent, you know, in terms of STI. So, me personally, man, I don't really have a say. I haven't really thought about it from a personal manner. You know, if my future son, uh, you know, am I going to get him circumcised? I don't know, actually. My assumption was yes, but once I read about this topic uh, in the past, and, and especially recently, then you really asked me, and I went through all the literature, you know, till this year. I don't really know if I'm going to do it now because uh, it's hard to say. All right, that, that's what I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, I don't really have an opinion on it, but this is the current state of this topic. If you have any specific questions or you want to talk more, comment below, and I'll be happy to answer even more. 
Next is by David. Hey Farhan, I hope you're well. I have a question that I hope you might have an answer to. The last two, three weeks, my sperm became extremely transparent and watery. I have no loss in libido, no other pain or symptoms, just an extremely watery sperm that comes out with close to none white or thickness to it. I never had that before and my girlfriend noticed quickly as well. Could it be related to testosterone? Even though my libido didn't reduce, I'll appreciate any uh, tips you have. So I wrote this down, okay? So, so uh, first and foremost, consult a urologist, period. Anything like that, any change in functionality or appearance that happens in your sexual system, you need to consult a urologist ASAP. Uh, let me go into a, a little bit of the science here. So the white uh, non-transparent or the thick part of your semen is the sperm, okay? So it could be an indication of low sperm count. Now, you just started noticing it recently, so it's probably not that. The second possibility is that uh, you're ejaculating too much. It's frequent ejaculation. So it takes about five hours for semen to replenish with all the ingredients like zinc, for example. So if you have a zinc deficiency or you have some other uh, nutrient that is in your semen that is deficient because the prostate and the seminal vesicles and other parts didn't have a chance to give the fluid necessary for your semen to be thick and, and, and awesome, <laughs> And if you're ejaculating uh, more frequently than every five hours, then you're probably gonna have watery and very, very thin, uh, uh, transparent, clear type sperm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would consult a urologist because the worst case, which is probably, possibly very bad, is a UTI, a urinary tract infection, or prostatitis. Uh, which is a disease of the prostate. So, because as you know, prostate also uh, helps give fluid to uh, have the semen complete. Okay, so these are the things I would talk to your urologist about and good luck, bro, and uh, talk soon. Next is by Hisham. So this is a long ass question. I'm gonna read it all because it probably has some, some, some interesting thoughts in it. So bear with me here. First and foremost, I have to express how grateful I am to you for your massive value you've offered in the past few years. I am a proud supporter of your movement. I first stumbled upon you in your video with Elliot Hulse when you explained the brain connection with exercise. Then I saw you with RSD Tyler and RSD members. I had this thought like, how did Farhan become affiliated with my mentors? And then coincidentally, you made videos where you broke down the mindset. Shah Rukh Khan, the donut shop story. It was all brilliant to me. Once again, thank you, bro. Our background is very, very similar. That's why I can relate to you easily. My family is from Pakistan, and we moved to Canada from Kuwait when I was born when I was four. I was born when I was four. Upbringing was rough starting out, but now we are doing very well. I was always fascinated with psychology, philosophy, and spirituality. I then became interested in neuroscience, which I read that you also studied. Similar to you, I have sexual repression and strict parents who have an outdated way of thinking. Nothing against them, just one just did what they thought was right. However, at this point in my life, I've been a problem. I'm 19 and living at home with my parents, doing university and working a part-time job. My older brother has a history of doing things like really hurt our family emotionally. He's currently living at home and ordering cocaine and doing it every few days. Rehab, detox, sending him to Pakistan. We tried it all, but no luck. Anyways, because of my parents became fearful and prevented me from pretty much having a social life. Controlling to sum it up. I have a strong vision to become an entrepreneur and live financially independent, be my own boss, live yourself, like yourself. But I'm struggling to find out where to start and think about it all day. Finding my passion, it is very hard. Anyways, my goal is to move out of my parents' house in the next couple of months by saving up and taking the hero's journey. The reason I'm saying this because I know you are able to resonate. If you could offer your insight or something I'm able to do, I would be beyond grateful because I aspire to be in a position like you. Elliot, Tyler, Kino Body, thank you and love you, bro. Love you too, man. Thank you for such a delightful and amazing question. Now, from my experience, the way you figure out your passion is by doing stuff that is currently your passion. 
that's it. So look at me, okay? My passion was computer science. I did my undergrad in computer science engineering from the University of Texas. I was a programmer, I worked for IBM, I worked for Nortel, uh, I worked for my university, I worked under a PhD student programming a lot of low level tasks for his miniature golf robotic simulation and he won the the phd prize of the year for our university that year right so i was super proud of the work i did now the interesting thing is that my passion was engineering coding programming learning about the theory of the computer and the turing machine and artificial intelligence right i was taking artificial intelligence courses in the early 2000s Right now you get all this machine learning stuff. I was reading machine learning books like 15 years ago. That's how old I am, right? So you need to understand that that was my passion. But then my passion became the brain and neuroscience because I wanted to understand people. I wanted to understand cultures, how people tick and what motivates people and, and what the hell is this human being thing and our fucking brain thing, what is that? So instead of building machines to uh, that are like the brain, I was like, we don't, no shit about the brain, so let's learn about the brain. So I studied neuroscience. I thought that was my passion. I wanted to win the Nobel Prize and become a famous professor. Maybe I will one day, but probably not. Then my passion became, well, working out, pickup, social dynamics, you know, understanding how groups work, understanding how to dominate a social environment, uh, hanging out with cool people, going to clubs, drinking, doing drugs. Uh, that was my passion, you know, living in Vegas, playing poker, gambling for a year nonstop with sports and poker and, and other card games and whatnot, right? Like that was my passion. Uh, then my passion became my business, you know, dog testosterone. Before that, it was, it was working out, right, with Elliot Hull, strength training, learning about breathing, bioenergetics, being with the body. Then it was my business, you know, going all in with dog testosterone. That's when my ego became all high did all those vegan gains videos and all that, all the hate stuff and all the marketing and gimmicky stuff, right? That was my dog testosterone passion. Now my passion is again about my body, learning about movement, right? Hip movements, glute movements, you know, making my posterior chain stronger, learning about veganism, going vegan for the last six months you know, experimenting on my body that way. Now I'm getting into my passion of supplements with herbal natural stuff like Tonkatali I'm gonna try in a couple of weeks, right? I'm gonna start that journey about how can I, cause my testosterone has doubled now, right? It went from around 350 to 800 almost, right? It's around like 740 now. I want that 740 to go up to 1000. How am I gonna do that? Well, my diet and my exercise and sleep is gonna be top notch, but I'm also now going to take herbal natural supplements, you know, plants, stuff that it's like spinach or kale, I'm eating that, so why am I not gonna try Tonkatali and other herbs that are right there on earth, uh, there for us to consume and gain benefit from, right? So now that's my passion. So why am I telling you this? Because you have to see what your passion is today. Let me give an example. Right now, you said you are spending all day thinking about your passion. Well, that's what you're doing, right? So figure out how everyone like me figured out their passion. That's your passion now, right? You ask me a question, ask Kinobody, ask Elliot, ask Tyler, ask everyone that you respect and follow. That's your passion. And then from that passion, you will figure out your next passion and then your next passion and your next passion. Kapish? Question nine. Dalbir Singh, just finished my MSc in gene and cell therapy, now contemplating a PhD. Throughout my university experience and personal homework, I find academia to be very bureaucratic with big pharma funded, drug centric, quackery shunning efforts applied over basic research and the monopoly of publishing journals, all stifling scientific progress. Therefore, with the same aggression and that ignites you to do what you do on screen, Instead of conducting lab experiments daily, I find myself more alive wanting to build structures for open science platforms, currently engaging in the blockchain community, etc. So I'm on the right track there. Actual question. I understand that possessing a PhD enables greater autonomy in the lab and also provides evidence for an independent work capacity. In business, for example, I'd like to ask, why should one commence a PhD in your opinion? I appreciate the analysis in your adventures post-education. If you could also enlighten us further, 
I appreciate the analysis of your adventures post-education. If you could also enlighten us further to your personal journey during your doctorate study, what you gained or would do differently, it would mean a lot. Would a PhD provide greater insight into the conduct of academia to solve aforementioned impediments? So one by one. Let's first go into, uh, uh, okay, so blah, blah, blah. Why should one commence a PhD in your opinion? So I'm going to give you a little secret. The real reason, so the neuroscience was fine. I want to study the brain, blah, blah, blah. That was probably like a big part of it. But the real reason that I don't really tell people because it's very personal, I'll tell you, is because I wanted to become smarter. So I did a PhD so I can manipulate information in my brain to ultimately become smarter and be in situations where I don't feel uncomfortable intellectually. The fact that I'm able to learn things really fast. Let me give you an example. Last time I was in my Pilates uh, with my personal trainer and she told me to do a movement and I fucked up completely. Then she made a small change and I did it perfectly. And you know what she said? She's like, holy shit. I suggested this small change and you did the movement perfectly from being a fuck up. You must have gotten straight A pluses in school. And she has no idea about my PhD and my straight A pluses. So it's because you have the ability to learn something really fast because your brain has that ability to deeply, deeply think. So if you became a YouTuber right away, without any PhD, or if you became a open form political po politics guy or talking in the, in the social in, you know, environment and, and stuff and making, making noise, you lost your ability to manipulate information in the brain and go deep. I went really deep when I studied visual neurophysiology, when I studied memory, I, I worked with monkeys, you know, I put electrodes in their brain, I injected stuff, I programmed, I developed experiments, analyzed data, published, uh, you know, fought with the reviewers for, for a year once just to publish a paper. All this deep thinking, like, you know, late at night, 2, 3 a.m., you're like thinking about some really, really particular topic that has to do with a cell in the monkey's brain and a channel or a type of neuronal activity that happens or a type of result you see in the visual system or a type of transformation that happens from one system to another like a like a, a type of model or type of mathematical equation that you've tried to model with right there's all these specific things that you go into really really deep when you're a phd so that would be one thing you'll miss so that's that the answer to that um, blah, blah, blah. If you could enlighten us further to your personal journey during your doctorate study, it would mean a lot. Okay. So my personal journey is when I was doing my master's, my supervisor died. You know, Angel Alonso, Dr. Alonso, may he rest in peace. Um, you know, my condolences and, and, and you know, m memoriam to him. Uh, so Dr. Alonso was 47 years old. I was doing my master's. I was two years in. I was about to transfer to the PhD program. I didn't want to do a master's. I want to do a PhD straight with him. So right before my comprehensives, he died of encephalitis, this really rare strain where, you know, he, he got it in Boston and he died. So me, as well as the other lab members, were like without a father. Right? That was our scientific father. He died. That was very, very unfortunate. Now, what we did was we all got another supervisor. So I got another supervisor. I finished my master's. Then I did my PhD in another lab. So I went through a lot of obstacles during my doctorate studies, which was able, you know, I was able to build my character. So in all the trolls and all the negative stuff that I get, I have really, really thick skin because I've been through a lot. Even in academia, I've like seen a lot of the experiences of pain and, and, and losing people that are really close to me. Uh, that are even close to my career and my life. So, so that is something I experienced in terms of my personal journey. Now, during my doctorate program, the first few years were fantastic because I was reading all the, the historical papers. I was, you know, the, like kind of, um, like you already know all this political and all this stuff. I wasn't even aware of this mumbo jumbo with, with politics and how papers are published and the big pharma thing and, and the involvement of the government in science. I wasn't aware of any of that. I was very, very ignorant. You know, ignorance is bliss. I was a very, very good student. You know, I published in my, in my second, like two years in, I already published as a PhD student. 
this was in 2009 when I did my first publication in the Journal of Neuroscience as the first author. Really, really good paper. I was in the news, uh, you know, with uh, you know, one of the newspapers, the French newspapers in, in Montreal. It was really, really good. You know, we published in Journal of Neuroscience, PNAS, another Journal of Neuroscience. Really, really good papers. Now, towards the end of my PhD, I realized that I want to do more social stuff. I want to learn about business. I want to learn about building uh, systems, you know, building big businesses and actually having money, you know, having financial freedom. I didn't want to drive a Civic or a Corolla like my supervisor did. You know, I wanted to not buy a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, but actually have the option to do that, you know, have the ability to do that have the ability to travel when I want it, not be able, not have the, the, the pressure of writing a grant or following some research that somebody wants me to do rather than what I want to do, right? So I understood what you already understand now into my fourth or fifth year. So I took a lot of time off. I learned about business. That's why it took me seven years to finish my PhD. The last two years, I was just learning about business, taking courses, driving all across America to do courses and, 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 and business cases with my McKinsey and BCG and other consulting friends who work for Google and Apple. And so I was doing cases with them just to understand uh, how business works, right? And then, you know, all my post journey. So that's my journey of my PhD. Uh, okay, what would I do differently? Uh, one thing I would do differently is not worry about publications, but actually worry about the science and only the science, right? So be like an Albert Einstein, right? Be like a Sir Isaac Newton, be like a Kepler or a Tesla, right? Be, uh, or a Niels Bohr, you know, what, be one of those very pure scientists who only care about the science and don't care about the politics and all this other stuff that's going on. I cared about publications. You know, I cared about getting the data, right? Like I wasn't like super crazy passionate about the work because it wasn't like I, I wasn't doing research on something that is like really close to my heart because I was studying the visual system, right? I was studying motion perception, you know, how, how an MT neuron works or an MST neuron works. And I published well, I, I discovered some new things that weren't known before, but it wasn't like something crazy passionate like I'm doing now with testosterone and, and masculinity and health and, 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 and confidence, right? It wasn't like that. So do something that you're really passionate about in that case. Uh, would a PhD provide greater insight into the conduct of academia to solve the affirmation impediments. I would not go into PhD to solve these problems. If you want to solve these problems, go into something like public health or some kind of political science topic if you want to fix those issues. I don't think you can fix those issues by... Now, you could do a PhD in public health or doing research on how pharma affects journals and, 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 and try to fight the system that way. But... If you're going to do a PhD, do it for the science specifically. Charles, uh, Charlie, Levia, any experience with turmeric capsules to help with inflammation? Oh, man. I just read a paper published this year, 2017, where it shows that turmeric has so many problems there is not a single clinical trial that shows that turmeric helps out or alleviates any disease at all. The only thing we see that turmeric might help with is the microbiome, right? So for those of you who don't know, the microbiome is the good bacteria in the gut, you know, in the large intestine, there's trillions of bacterial cells in there. Um, and there is some evidence to sh that shows that turmeric might help the microbiome, but it, in terms of disease and Alzheimer's disease and arthritis and uh, MS and obesity and all, all these things, there is not a single study that convincingly shows that turmeric actually helps. So the $150 million of supplementation money uh, that is running around in the US every year for just turmeric capsules and powders and extracts uh, for now, it's bullshit. Now, why? So there are certain topics in, when it comes to turmeric or other supplements that are very important for the body uh, to actually function with. So for example, for turmeric, so the active compound inside turmeric that uh, has been studied with all these experiments is known as curcumin. Okay, it's a very small percentage of turmeric, uh, but curcumin 
doesn't have very good bioavailability. So when you ingest turmeric capsules, it's not really available for your body to use. That's one. Two, the absorption rate is very low for turmeric. Three, the advantages sometimes don't outweigh the disadvantage. So there is a possibility of toxicity if you eat more than 12 grams per day of turmeric. So that is also something you need to understand. And finally, something that uh, turmeric is not good for is the ability for it to uh, be pharmacokinetic, PK. What does that mean? The ability for it to travel to different organs to help those organs out. This is the same problem with blood tests, right? So if you do a blood test and you get your magnesium or your, your zinc reading, it may not be accurate. Why? Because the blood is being tested. So there might be zinc or magnesium present in the blood, but is it being used by the different organ system? Is it pharmacokinetic? Right? So that's another aspect of turmeric that really, really fails. So me personally, I eat turmeric. I don't do 12 grams a day for sure. I eat it like a culinary diet, right? I put it in my food, I put it in my spice shots, I put it in my coffee. I eat a little bit every day, you know, a couple of teaspoons, let's say, uh, or sometimes more, but a little bit more. But in terms of capsules and spending a ton of money on turmeric, the research is not out, the evidence is not there at all. Now again, it could help with the microbiome, which is great because inflammation uh, will be a factor in that. Um, so if I were you, as long as you don't go too toxic, it's okay but the scientific research is not there yet. And the studies that are there, the, either the number of people they use for the study is too low, the significance is not very good and not very convincing. So uh, that's what I would say, all right? And especially for normal people, like you know, people who are just healthy individuals, uh, the research is definitely not there, all right? I hope it is there because a lot of people are spending a lot of money on this stuff and I hope that uh, it does work out, all right? So that's... The Fridays with Farhan episode 11. Again, I'm sorry that this wasn't published on a Friday. Uh, from next time, it's my New Year's resolution to make it every single Friday. And uh, I hope that happens in the coming future. Again, Happy New Year to you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, submit them below and I'll answer them in episode 12 next Friday. And uh, yeah, uh, subscribe to the channel. Share it with your friends if they can benefit. Give a thumbs up. Uh, hit the like button so YouTube increases it in its algorithm and other people get it and gain value from it. And uh, yeah, that's what I would like to say. This is Farhan. Thanks very much for listening. Happy New Year and see you next time.